Hi, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for joining. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Pietro Landi. Um, just a bit of background information. Pietro did his PhD in Italy at the Polytechnic University of Milan, received his PhD in 2014, and then moved to South Africa um, to be a postdoc. He stayed in Stellenbosch for five years in mathematics, working in the group of Kang uh, Wee um, on biomathematics. Um, he also has collaboration with the Center for Invasive Biology, also with SESIMA, and he's worked on many topics uh, with these groups um, related to biomathematics, so population dynamics, metabolic networks, evolutionary dynamics. Uh, he's been hired, we're fortunate to have him as a, a lecturer from last year, he started this year. And today's talk is about work that he did as part of his PhD, which he also published as a book with Word Scientific. It's a talk that attracts usually lots of people. We have many people today, actually, uh, close to 40 participants. The Mathematics of Love, um, the stage is yours, Pietro. Thank you so much, Hugo, for the kind introduction. And thanks to Diane and Laura from COMAS for the seminar series. And also thanks to Nick and Andre from Applied Maths who thought about me um, for this seminar. Maybe I will stop my video uh, while I talk, not to slow down the, the slides. Uh, I will switch it on again at the end with the Q&A. And apologies uh, for that interlude in Italian, but uh, it's long time colleagues and friends that I haven't seen in a long time, and I will mention them again during the talk. Uh, so yeah, today um, the title is The Mathematics of Love, and uh, let's see. Okay, let's um, jump back in time to see where this all started. In 1980, um, Professor George Levinger uh, from the University of Massachusetts uh, published a paper in the Journal of Experimental Social Psychology. He's actually a real psychologist, and in this paper he shows that the great majority of people are actually able to describe the dynamics of their relationships using a single variable. So in this case, uh, we can see on the horizontal axis there is time, on the vertical axis there is the involvement in the relationship or the reciprocal feelings or love, um, whatever we want to call it. And uh, in this case, it's a couple of a he and a she. And uh, in this relationship, we can see that um, the guy is positively involved since the beginning, he's very eager. Um, she doesn't like him too much at the beginning, but then he uh, he's persistent and he's very caring towards her because he has a good involvement. So eventually she kind of changes her mind and also her involvement starts uh, increasing and they end up uh, in a good steady state where both have positive feelings. And I'm, I'm sure all we can all relate to that myself. I can, if I think backwards in time, I can definitely say the first three months of that relationships were great, then things started to decline gradually, and of course, everything ended badly. But anyways, um, I'm sure we can all relate to this concept. And uh, um, just a few examples of possible uh, dynamics of relationship. Um, this one is a, yeah, a positive one. Uh, we always, in this plot, uh, we always start from zero, assuming that uh, when the people meet, don't know each other, of course, and they don't have any um, any uh, feelings uh, before that. Uh, in this case, we uh, have already showed the previous example. At the beginning, the feelings are the involvement is negative, it's not good, but then with time, uh, something changes and the relationship um, behaves and tends towards a positive state. And in this example, there's a there's a relationship or the involvement of this person that goes ups and down um, with time. We can think of many more other uh, dynamic behavior of these relationships and you can try to uh, draw your own uh, graphical representation as actually um, is shown in that paper. Many people were interviewed and they actually managed to draw the dynamics of their feelings through time. And if we have two individuals and each of them uh, can plot their own involvement through time uh, during a relationship. We can then put those together and 
created like a phase plane dynamics of the couple where we have the dynamic the feeling, the involvement of one individual on the horizontal axis and the involvement of the other individual in the vertical axis. And in this case, uh, both start positively and they converge to an equilibrium or a steady state where they're both happy and they have positive feelings towards each other. We all wish uh, relationships would be that easy. And uh, again, we can think of many examples of um, couple dynamics. This one is basically the one that I uh, discussed already. X1 is always increasing while X2 starts uh, negative but then goes up um, and finally they both reach a positive state. Um, this case they both start very nicely positive but then something happens and feelings um, first one becomes negative and then both becomes negative. I guess this one represents most of my relationships. Um, and this one is where the two, the feelings of the two people, yeah, they start positive, but they, instead of reaching a steady state, they reach another kind of um, dynamic regime, which is a cycle and feelings oscillate through time. And uh, in 1988, um, another professor from the US, Steven Strogatz, um, I think he's now at Cornell, but at the time he was at Harvard and basically won a prize for the best lecture in mathematics of the year. So he could write a note in the Harvard mathematics magazine. And this is his full paper, one page, and basically he describes why he won, those, he won those, uh, that prize. And basically he says that he teaches differential equations using the example of a love relationship between Romeo and Juliet. And he says that this is very good for students because it attracts their attention and he helps to it helps to involve the students a lot uh, during the class. And uh, yeah, that's that's the basically the first differential equation of love dynamics that was written in in history. And uh, in the discussion paragraph, he mentions nonlinear terms, uh, poets, and many body problems, which are all topics that I will discuss briefly in this talk. And in 1998 and onwards, um, this is the real, the real gangster of love dynamics, Sergio Rinaldi, uh, who is present here, I'm very happy. Um, and basically, um, I worked with him for my master's and my PhD, and then I also collaborated with the rest of the research team in uh, Milan, Italy at Politecnico. And uh, basically from 1998 onwards, he started to systematically uh, build this topic of modeling love dynamics, starting from the idea of Strogas that uh, feelings could, um, I mean, from the first idea of Levinger that feelings could be represented by one single variable changing with time, and from the idea of Strogas that you can actually describe that dynamics uh, with a differential equation. Um, I didn't lose too much time on Strogatz's model, but basically um, that model was quite simple. It was linear and um, basically the, it was just a coupled oscillator. So he used love as a way of teaching differential equation to attract students' attention rather than mechanistically try to describe love. So the great contribution of Sergio is that he actually um, takes these ideas, but he tries to mechanistically describe love dynamics. And yeah, I, I, I was so lucky to um, work with him and Fabio Della Rosa, and Fabio D'Ercole and Alessandra Gragnani. Um, they're all here. I'm very happy to see them. And thanks a lot for um, involving me in this project. And all this research culminated in this book from 2016, uh, published by World Scientific. And I have to say, yesterday evening, I had to refresh my memory. So I had to go back to the book and read some chapters. And it's really great. Uh, I think it's a real masterpiece. Um, congratulations, Sergio. And basically what, um, from from now on, I'm basically, describing the research that mostly Sergio did in these past um, 20 years. Uh, so when I say we, uh, maybe I just mean him and we were working together. Um, 
but basically the main assumptions of this model is that um, yeah there are in this case there is a couple two individuals um, x1 is the feeling of the first person and x2 is the feeling of the second person towards each other the dot notation is the time derivative so this is a um, ordinary differential equation and basically in this model um, the assumptions are that there are three terms uh, we can see one is negative and the other two as most of the time positive and they are called oblivion the negative one and then we have the reaction to love and the reaction to appeal i will now try to uh, explain what these are and in principle well the the two uh, equations are similar to each other they are kind of mutual so i will i will only focus on one and um, the first one is oblivion which is negative in principle all these functions can be functions of both the feelings but we will see um, we will make some simplifying assumptions in fact typically oblivion is just a function of your own feelings and it just describes an exponentially decreasing um, factor in the model that means that if you interrupt a relationship after a reasonable amount of time you would lose your involvement with that person and that is reasonable um, the second term is called reaction to love and it's mostly positive and it basically says how much um, positive flow of love we get uh, from the love that we receive from the other person so for instance um, we can assume that if we assume it that g1 is only a function of x2 as we can see in these two plots uh, the more most people uh, have this um, increasing function and that means that the more we are loved the more we respond we reciprocate love in a positive way and uh, if this function is monotonically increasing either linearly or non-linearly this type of individuals are called secure in the psychology of love literature and most people have this kind of behavior um, it's reasonable to assume that and it's also been let's say proved with interviews and um, yeah we can either choose a linear function or a non-linear one uh, i'll probably discuss that a bit later but then there's another type of individuals which is called insecure and basically they after the love they receive starts to be too high um, they start to react negatively negatively so these people basically don't like uh, the idea of having a long-term relationship or they don't want to be involved in a relationship so they only react positively when um, the relationship is not too strong when the love they receive is not too high the final term is called the reaction to appeal um, it's also in theory a function of both x1 and x2 but most of the time um, it's only a function of the appeal and i will spend maybe a minute to talk about the appeal the appeal is the only let's say parameter that appears in this model or the most relevant parameter that can actually change from person to person and uh, um, it's also not an objective uh, quantity but it it relates it depends on the person on the other person in the relationship so basically beauty is in the eye of the beholder every person is um, different to the eyes of anyone else and we can think of it as um, basically some objective individual traits of a person like beauty age health wealth whatever and these are then weighted by the subjective weights that the other person give to those traits so if i have a certain yeah age beauty uh wealth health and wealth um, they are weighted differently by any other people so my appeal is different um, to any other people uh, and usually we assume this reaction to be linear with the appeal and the idea is that uh, using uh, um, just some assumption of the psychology of individuals how they react to 
to the love that they receive and how they weight different components of the appeal, we can basically predict at least qualitatively the behavior of such couples. And uh, um, basically, yeah, most couples are uh, called standard. So it means that individuals are secure and it means that their reaction to love is monotonically increasing. Also, they are not uh, biased or they are unbiased. So basically, uh, their own feelings, I mean, the feelings do not impact their reaction to love and their reaction to appeal. So basically, we end up with this simplified model where the two equations are similar and they kind of uh, mirror each other. So we have oblivion, we have um, a linear reaction to appeal, and we have a monotonically increasing reaction to love, which is usually that sigmoidal shape. And uh, using these assumptions, um, basically we can see what could happen um, for standard couples. Um, so the idea is that we take that model again, where the reaction to love function is this sigmoidal shape. It's monotonically increasing, but it's nonlinear. And uh, if we study this model, we basically, uh, I mean, in these papers, Sergio, Alessandra, and Fabio, and Fabio, they basically found out that, um, yeah, you can study this model by looking at the isoclines, which is when the time rate of change of the two feedings are equal to zero. Uh, so the shape of the isocline resembles the shape of the reaction to love uh, G1 function. And this is the isocline for the feelings of individual one. Uh, this is the isocline for the yeah, feelings of individual two. And if you put these together, the intersection of isoclines gives us equilibria of the dynamics. So here we can see that these two lines um, intersect at three points, x prime, x second, and x third. And um, basically two of them are stable, the green ones, and the intermediate ones is a stable or is actually a saddle point. So basically the stable manifold of the saddle, which is that blue trajectory, separates the two basins of attraction of the other two equilibria. So we can see that this standard couples, which is probably the most frequent in yeah, in the world, they have two alternative stable states. That means that they usually have one which is better than the other. So X3 is better than X1 because of course both uh, feelings are positive. And, and basically this can be done for any pairs of appeals. That means for any couple imaginable. So if we just basically look at the behavior of the system changing the two appeals um, that appear in the, in the model A2 and A1 in the second equation, we can basically classify the behavior of, uh, of the couple in the long term. And basically we use this model to also interpret some famous love stories. The first one is Beauty and the Beast. Uh, well, it's a story which is present in, in many cultures. Uh, it's been present for a long time, but then, uh, yeah, it was popularized by a movie in 1991. And um, basically, yeah, we use this theory of standard couples, standard nonlinear couples. And as I said, in the, in the left panel, we can actually, um, given any two values of appeals, we can see how many equilibria there are for the system. And in the yellow region, uh, there are two equilibria. Um, no, sorry, in the yellow region, there is only one equilibria, but it's yellow because um, one feeling is positive there while the other is negative. In the green region, there is only one equilibrium and both feelings are positive there. And in the white region, we have those alternative stable states. And uh, we can see these points one, two, three, they correspond to the equilibria in the central panel, um, where we plotted the isoclines of the two feelings and how those isoclines translate with a different appeal. And basically, this is representing the fact that 
uh, well, as we can see, beauties appeal is always uh, positive, greater than one, while of course the appeal of the beast at the beginning is very negative, or at least beauty perceives the beast um, with a negative appeal because he looks uh, terrible, of course. But then with time, the beast proves itself or himself to be um, worthy, to be brave, to be... Um, he likes poetry and music. He has a huge library. He actually also saves Beauty's lives when she was attacked by wolves. So basically, she uh, the appeal of the beast changes in the eyes of Beauty with these steps that go from one to two to three and four. And what happens is that their relationship uh, initially goes to a point where um, of course, the beauty has negative feelings. She is actually repelled by the beast, but slowly with time, the equilibrium moves and then eventually it jumps to point four. And we can see that, of course, the love of beauty towards the beast in the end is positive. So that's the, fine, the, the final uh, part of the movie and likely they live happily ever after. Um, there used to be nice videos in this talk, but I had to remove them because they were making the presentation quite heavy and Zoom uh, didn't like it. So here there was a video uh, with a song and it was very nice, but yeah, sorry about that. Um, the same uh, the same ideas also apply to this other story, uh, Pride and Prejudice, uh, which was written by Jane Austen, of course, and it was turned into a movie in 2005. And these are the two main characters. And here too, uh, yeah, we use the same theory. And what happens is that uh, we start from point one, where um, basically both uh, peers are negative because Darcy is the guy basically he declares that he's not interested into Elizabeth because um, she comes from a family that is not doing very well at the moment. He's a nobleman, so he doesn't he doesn't like uh, that. And and also behaving like like this, uh, Elizabeth uh, finds out. And so also his appeal turns out to be negative to her. But then uh, with time, basically Elizabeth shows. Uh, basically proves him wrong, uh, proves that he had lots of prejudice against her and her family. Uh, she's actually very clever, very witty, very smart. She plays the piano, she she reads poetry. So basically her appeal increases um, in the eyes of Darcy's um, until basically we reach uh, point five in a yellow region. Um, and at point five, basically Darcy's love becomes from negative to positive, as we can see here. And at that point, um, but at that point, Darcy's appeal is still negative in the eyes of Elizabeth. So Elizabeth still have negative feelings um, while he starts to be involved with her. But at the end, what happens is that, yeah, basically Darcy kind of declares himself, but she, she repels him. Um, and then he basically sends a letter to her apologizing and basically justifying all his past behaviors. And he actually had good reasons for behaving, uh, let's say, badly. Um, so basically, also his appeal, she realizes that he also had misunderstood him. So his appeal in the eyes of Elizabeth jumps 2.6. And in point six, um, there is only one positive equilibrium where both feelings are. Uh, are positive. So hopefully they live happily and merrily ever after. Same ideas uh, also to interpret this story, the Cyrano de Bergerac, French uh, novel, and uh, also, well, more an act than a model, it's like poetry. And yeah, it was turned into a movie in 1990. This one is a bit more complicated. Um, so basically, Cyrano is a very clever and educated man, but he has a huge nose, so he's basically considered ugly. And he falls in love with Roxana. Uh, she's also beautiful and clever and intellectual, uh, but Roxanne basically uh, likes Christian, who is uh, basically a soldier. He's in the army, so he's good looking, but 
is yeah not a really intellectual and um, Cyrano doesn't want to reveal his feelings to Roxanne because he knows that he would be repelled because of his nose and uh, um, Roxanne tells Cyrano that she likes Christian so actually Cyrano is friend with Christian they talk and um, Christian would like to go and speak with Roxanne but he's also afraid um, that is too different from her. Uh, he's almost illiterate while she's very educated. So he's also afraid to uh, approach her. So what happens is that Cyrano and Christian may make an agreement where um, basically Cyrano writes letter on behalf of Christian to send to Roxanne. So basically Cyrano is disguising himself uh, under the behind the beauty of Christian and writes letter to Roxanne. And she actually starts to fall in love with this person, which is Cyrano with the face of Christian. Um, and then what happens is, well, let me just go back. What happens is um, when she's completely in love, then Christian dies in the war. Uh, he was sent to war and he dies. And um, Cyrano is never able to declare himself, um, although Roxanne admittedly says that she loves Christian mostly for his letters and not for his appearance. Um, but after the war, after Christian dies, she is very depressed, she, so she becomes a nun, she goes into a convent, and the uh, um, Cyrano finds out where she is after only 15 years, a crazy long period of time, and he goes and visits her, but on his way there he gets ambushed and is wounded very badly. So at the end when he meets Roxanne, he's kind of, sorry about the spoiler, but his final wish is to read the last letter that Christian wrote to her. And uh, it's actually quite dark already. He starts reading the letter, and probably the letter is very long. And by the time he's about to finish, it's complete dark. But he's actually not reading the letter. He knows it by heart because he actually wrote it. So Roxanne only then, after 15 years, realizes that she actually loves uh, Cyrano. And she tells him, oh, yeah, I love you. But he dies there. Um, very sad, uh, very sad tragedy. And there was a video here to, to spoil the end of the movie, but I already spoiled it for you anyways. Um, and to describe this story, basically, uh, we can see that if the if Cyrano would just uh, declare himself from the beginning, um, his ugly uh, face would contribute to him having a negative appeal, and that would be responsible for the fact that the initial relationship would tend would tend towards point B um, if he declares himself initially. But basically, with this uh, strategy of this agreement with Christian, he manages to temporarily increase his appeal, and that shifts the the saddle basically and its stable manifold so that now the origin which is where um, we always start the relationship is now in the basin of attraction of point g uh, so at this at this moment when roxanne starts to receive the letters she actually can develop positive feelings that she couldn't have done otherwise and uh, even after, let's say after that's the moment when she realizes um, that Cyrano was in fact the author of the letters, even though he has a negative uh, appeal because he's ugly, now the feelings of Roxanne are such that she would eventually reach point G anyways. Um, so this temporary, we call it temporary bluffing because Cyrano is pretending to be Christian basically. Um, but with this strategy is actually able to uh, end up in a good relationship with Roxanne, although it lasts only for a second. Um, even though if he would have started that relationship at the beginning without the laughing, he would have ended in a negative state. Okay, so uh, now I will briefly talk about um, non-standard couples. So basically we 
classified couples to be standard if individuals are secure that means that they have a monotonically increasing reaction to love um, and if they are not biased so if their love doesn't affect their own reaction to love and appeal but there are also insecure individuals as i said so basically the model is the same only the shape of g changes at this time so as i said after the relationship um, after the involvement is too much the involvement from the other partner is too much the reaction starts to go down and it can actually even become negative so these are insecure individuals they don't want uh, they basically don't want relationships and even in this case uh, if we study the isocline there can be alternative equilibria um, and basically we used uh, this model with an insecure reaction function to describe the love story gone with the wind which is also from a book but it was also made popular by a movie and uh, yeah it, basically here we chose to use insecure uh, reaction functions because the individuals clearly uh, show that they are insecure although in the previous stories we didn't have any um, hints as to the individuals were secure or insecure it's safe to assume that most individuals unless otherwise stated are secure but in this case in the movie and probably in the book as well uh, it is clear that these two uh, scarlet and red are insecure um, where well, red is a kind of a casanova type of guy and uh, scarlet um, she likes to be surrounded by lots of uh, men and they court her but she always basically turns turns them down so they both have this kind of behavior so we assume the reaction function is um, declining and what happens is that if, if we put those um, two insecure individuals together um, yeah this can happen so basically we can see uh, in the first part of the story we start from point zero the feelings evolve to this point up here where red is more involved than scarlet um, and that is basically what happens in the first part of the movie before the civil war and basically red somehow declares himself and kisses scarlet but scarlet slaps him in the face um, not nice and uh, then basically there's a uh, this dash line is the civil war they are separated for a long time actually red goes and fights in the war i think and uh, so they both forget each other for some time and then they meet again after the war they start from point seven and what happens then is that the feelings evolve towards this other point where actually now scarlet is more involved than red um so at the end um yeah they are together for some time but then he wants to leave uh, i mean he leaves and here unfortunately also there was a nice uh, movie clip where frankly my dear he doesn't give a damn and leaves her uh yeah he does also an animation okay this is also um, yeah an animation of their love story uh, before the war red is more involved than scarlet but after the war uh, and so basically uh, she refuses him and after the war um, scarlet is more involved than red and he leaves her um, another relaxing other assumptions uh, from the standard um, couples model basically we can uh, also um, assume that your own feelings can alter your reaction to the other person appeal so if if your feelings are reducing your reaction it's called the platonic individual that means the more i am involved the less i am attracted to the partner in a way um, or the other way around it's called synergic so the more i'm involved the more i'm attracted to the partner and there are cases of both individuals apparently in the psychology literature 
and in this kind of model, uh, if we study this model theoretically, we can find periodic solutions that I briefly showed at the beginning, and finally now we we actually get to see them. And um, periodic solutions are also fi found in the love story between Francesco Petrarca and Laura de Sade, which is narrated in a in the Canzoniere, which is a collection of poems written by Petrarca in a very long period of time. And uh, yeah, here there's just a verse from the Canzoniere that uh, actually makes us think about a periodic uh, dynamic of the feelings. I think I will just let you read it. I don't want to spoil uh, Petrarca's poetry. But yeah, this gives the idea of a turbulent relationship with ups and downs. And in fact, uh, this was probably the first work done by Sergio in 1998. And uh, the very nice thing here is that uh, there was another um, scholar, Frederick Jones, that in 1995, he was actually a literature scholar. So he was studying Petrarch, probably studied Petrarch for his own life. And basically he studied the Canzoniere. Yeah, you can see the horizontal axis in 20 years. And basically reading the, the, the poems, um, he can actually score. I mean, he came up with a way of scoring his love towards Laura in, in in each time step. And those are the squares that we see in these figures. So those are kind of data which are um, collected by yeah, a scholar studying Petrarch, reading his poems. And the line is a simulation of, of Sergio's model, which predicts a periodic solution, of course. And we can see a relatively, I mean, a very nice fit, relatively good fit of the model to the data, but at least qualitatively, we can see a periodic behavior and um, in both the data and the, and the model. And finally, uh, I'll get to the most complex love story that I'm going to talk about, uh, which is a many body problem. This is the story of, well, the real names are written up there, uh, but it's made popular by a novel and a book uh, called the Jules Jim, French story. This is actually a real story. Um, so Franz Hessel, Helen Grund, and Henri Pierre Rocher are the real names of these three people. And actually, um, let's call them Jules and Jim. They are friends. And yeah, they're also friends with Kate, of course. And they some somehow live together um, for about 20 years. And what happens is that uh, basically Kate um, somehow loved them both and she stayed with either of them. I mean, she switched between either of them for uh, seven times across those 20 years. Um, and yeah, the relationship of course is quite turbulent and uh, of course, we can think we have seen stationary solutions, we have seen periodic solutions, so now we kind of expect to see chaotic solutions, and that's exactly what happens. And uh, basically, uh, yeah, in this model from from Rocher's uh, novel, uh, which is autobiographical and it's actually based on his diaries, um, Fabio and Sergio basically um, found out somehow some psychological traits of Kate, Jules, and Jim. So basically Kate is insecure and synergic, so she has a decreasing reaction to love, and her love uh, increases her reaction to the appeal. And then Jules is platonic, so basically his own love decreases his reaction to Kate's appeal. And Jim is insecure, so he has a decreasing um, reaction to love. And putting these all these three bombs together uh, basically, of course, gives rise to uh, deterministic chaos. As we can see on the left hand side, we have the, yeah, like a heat map of, a, of the Lyapunov exponent of the system. And a positive Lyapunov exponent, exponent is a signature of uh, deterministic chaos. And we can see that, um, yeah, the, the model is, uh, is chaotic for a wide area of, of the parameter region. And on the right hand side, we can see a simulation of the strange attractor 
um, projected in the plane of uh, x1 and y1. And uh, yeah, deterministic chaos was basically discovered by Lawrence in 1963, studying weather systems. And this is a popular representation of its attractor. And one feature of chaos is that it's unpredictable because two uh, very close trajectories uh, after a finite time, they actually diverge, diverge with a finite rate. So it's, it's very unpredictable to forecast um, to forecast these kind of systems for a long time. And the love story of Keiju regime is very unpredictable and very turbulent. Um, and a very nice thing is that from, from the novel, which is a kind of, yeah, autobiography, um, basically the times of the, of the switch of the partner from Kate are known. So basically here we can see across the 20 or 21 years, um, the blue intervals uh, are when Kate is basically staying with Jewel and then she switches to Jim. And basically we know that from the novel and we can also find them from the model. I mean, Sergio and Fabio found them from the model simulation and we can see a relatively, again, a relatively good fit um, between the model and the data. Um, so that means, yeah, that the the dynamics is reasonable, is turbulent and unpredictable. Um, in the diaries, they also declared that it was kind of painful because they never knew where it was going to, to end. And I don't want to spoil this movie, but yeah, it also ends quite badly. And um, so many things in the in the novel and in the movie point to the deterministic chaos dynamics of this system, which is of course uh, captured in the model. And uh, with this, I would like to thank uh, Sergio, Fabio, Fabio and Alessandra. So happy you were here. I hope you're still here. And um, I hope I made justice to this um, huge amount of work that you did. And I was very happy to join in. And yeah, thanks all of you for being here. and. I'm happy to take any question. Thank you, Pietro. Thank you for the good talk. Um, Thanks. Any questions? any questions from the audience? Now you can you can raise your hand or you can put your microphone on just to ask the question to Pietro. There's a question and a discussion which I can read to you. Um, yeah. Um, it's a question about um, accounting for different a different kind of relationship where, for instance, you can be forced to get married, for instance, and so uh, arrange marriage. Do you see how this you could you mm -hmm. could model into the the picture, like maybe by adding a, a new variable, like another variable that accounts for the, in a way, like the forcing into the relationship, or will be like um, a non-standard non -standard couple again. Yeah, bro. I mean, if you have more than one relationship, you can, of course, take that into account as I sh showed at the end now. If you are forced into a relationship, uh, I guess you have to, well, you can basically model what's going to happen. Um, and probably since you are forced, you would have a negative starting point or probably you would, would have a negative, I mean, the partner would have a negative appeal to you because it's just forced on you. So yeah, I guess that somehow could could uh, could be implemented in the model. So it's in the in the response function that you put in the differential equations. Um, I'm not sure where to exactly put an arrange. Well, of course, if they don't know each other and they have never seen each other, maybe the starting point should be zero, mm -hmm. unless. The fact that they are forced into it puts them already in a very bad mood. Ah, so okay. then so you, you can change condition. you can change your initial condition, or maybe you can change yeah the the appeal of the partner. You can just perceive it as negative because okay. it's something that is forced onto you. Okay, good. Thanks. There's a question from Guillaume Guillaume Latombe. Hi Guillaume, how are you? Hey, hi good Guillaume. To see you. Good to see you, man. <laughs> uh, hair is growing. Yeah, your beard too. Yeah, so, exactly. I think you're equal. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for the talk. I've heard about it like for a long time, so finally good to good to finally see it. 
Uh, I had just Thanks. a quick question about the, especially the beauty and the beast parts. I mean, I'm not a psychologist, but often people talk about um, Stockholm syndrome in this case, you know, like uh, where the abuser becomes like a start to uh, fall in love. Sure. Uh, or the, no, the abused person starts to fall in love. Yeah, with yeah. The I saw the movie and, as well. But um, like, how do you, can you incorporate this kind of psychological, like, uh, yeah, syndromes and stuff like that in these equations? I think so. I mean, the Stockholm syndrome, yeah, I think uh, the name comes from, uh, it was a bank robbery. So a bank robber basically um, keep hostage many people for a few days in a bank in Stockholm. And one of the hostages, yeah, slow after that, falls in love with him. Um, yeah, I guess one could, uh, I mean, I think that can happen from these models. Um, I don't know what will be the best way to incorporate that, but basically maybe they have some, I mean, their kind of reactions are compatible and maybe somehow their appeal, or at least the initial perception of the appeal is positive, or maybe it, it goes from negative, like, yeah, initially maybe the guy looks like the beast, but then they basically, they were living there in the bank for a few days together and he maybe it turns out to be not as bad as one could expect at the beginning. So it could happen. Yeah, maybe something similar to Beauty and the Beast in a way and then can you so that makes me think can you have some eventually some feedbacks when you know like the, the further you start because of biases for example the more you might like have a rebound or this kind of thing in these equations uh, you you can have terms where like like being synergic and platonic uh where your own feelings affect how you behave so you can have those feedbacks sure Thanks. That was super interesting. Yeah, thanks. Good to see you, man. Good to see you too. Thanks. There's another question from Augustine. You can put your microphone on. Oh, yes. Um, I'm just wondering uh, something that the previous uh, person typed in the chat. Uh, there's a part of it that's which I'm also very interested in getting clarification. That is uh, when love does not grow, uh, but the relationship continues to thrive. Um, I would guess that maybe your model might just be when there's love from both sides and everything is flowing and then it's going and going. But you find that in real life, sometimes there's no love at all and the relationship continues to work to remain and they keep on moving on. Um, did you factor that into your uh, uh, calculation somehow? Sure. Yeah, I see what you mean. Thanks. Um, I mean, in this model, the outcome can also be negative. So the equilibrium or any attractor can also represent negative feelings. Um, and when feelings are negative, I mean, if, if there are no constrictions from the outside, then normally people leave each other. But if there are larger constrictions um, around the couple to stay together, they might even stay together, although their feelings are negative. Um, so if we, if we only look at the couple, the feelings are negative, but then there are external forces which are bigger than that, which kind of force them to be together. So. I might interpret that in this way, because in this model, we only basically include the psychology of the people and the, let's say, appeal of, of yeah, each other. And we don't have any other external factors imposed on the, on the relationship. Um, so I don't know if this answers your question. Yeah, thank you. There's another question in the in the chat from Sandra McFadden. Um, are you are you ignoring external factors when modeling these relationships? 
um, like background landscape properties. I don't know if you see, you can see in the chat. Uh, I can see, yeah. I mean, I guess there's a lot of background interactions that you, you can include in the response functions when you're writing the differential equations, right? Yeah, uh, thanks, Sandra. Yeah, for now, as I said, we basically ignore everything that is outside the couple. Uh, so basically, we assume the couple lives in an isolated world. Um, you can stochastically perturb the model with some kind of shocks and see what happens. Um, that would be big events in life that can affect your involvement. And as, as, as I showed also, the perception of their field can change. That can change uh, when you find something in life. Even your psychology can change. Maybe you, when you are young, you are secure. And then when you are older, you become insecure or vice versa. Um, so those functions, which for now we assume to be constant through time, they could change their shape uh, on a longer time scale and give rise to more complex dynamics, sure. Good, thank you. Other questions? Thanks, Sandra, for the question. Okay, I have another question. I have another, yes. question. I have another yes. question, quickly, please. Please, um, sure. What about uh, fantasy love from a distance? Uh, you know, when the two people never meet and they really get to be in love with each other. I know somehow pen pal is connected sure. with this, but there has been some serious deep feelings that uh, uh, got experienced through this type of loving. Um, wh what about it? Did it uh, make, make it into your uh, study? I just want to find out. Yeah, we didn't do explicitly, but I mean, in principle, um, we don't strictly assume that people have to meet physically. They can even meet uh, virtually and write letters to each other. In fact, I mean, the story between Cyrano and Roxanne is mostly uh, a story based on love letters. They, they don't meet very often. And yeah, most of the relationship is kind of virtual in a way. So yeah, the, this model doesn't preclude the fact that you, you can develop love um, even without meeting or from a distance. Good. More questions? Good. If not, I think we can we can stop the, the talk here.